I think it's fair to say that marriage is not honoured by society in anywhere near the way that it ought to be. And of course, it's not God's will for every person uh, to marry. Uh, There are those uh, whom the Lord would have to serve him in a life of singleness, and there's nothing wrong about that. There's nothing second class about that at all. And so it's not the will of God for everyone to marry. But where two people do come together in marriage, that union is to be treasured and it is to be valued. There are, uh, of course, plenty of evidences today that it's not valued in anywhere near the same way as Scripture would uphold marriage. You know, there's, there's plenty who undervalue it so much that they'll happily live together, even more or less all their lives, without ever actually getting married. Uh, apparently, even uh, among those who do get married, nearly 80% of couples have first of all been living together and today, yeah, living in a sort of marriage-like sort of setup, but without marriage itself. Uh, and then undoubtedly, as I say, there's many who never uh, at all get round to formalizing their relationship and joining in marriage. Uh, and then on top of that, even for those who do, sadly marriage today is not a thought to be the permanent thing uh, that it, it is set forth in Scripture. It's not considered to be a permanent Commitment, according to uh, one st- set of statistics, uh, I wasn't sure if it was from this year or from a recent year, it mentioned that on average there are 326 marriages uh, each day across Australia, uh, weddings. But sadly, about one in every three will end in divorce. Now, last week we were in Matthew 5, and Christ there was expounding the seventh commandment and teaching many of the implications and the connected issues regarding that commandment, thou shalt not commit uh, adultery. And there in Matthew 5, having shown that lust is a breach of the seventh commandment and that it's very possible for us to break the seventh commandment even in our hearts, the Lord then goes on to emphasize this very issue of divorce. He, He says in Matthew 5 and from verse 31, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So the Lord there shows that divorce is directly connected with the seventh commandment and with a breaking of the seventh commandment. And so so we're going to give attention to this issue today as we continue to look at the Ten Commandments and this commandment, thou shalt not commit uh, adultery. We're considering this sad subject of of divorce. Now, first of all, let's just stress the tragedy of divorce. Uh, And the tragedy of divorce essentially flows from the fact that marriage is meant to be permanent. In the passage that we read in in Matthew 19, uh, the Pharisees come to test or tempt Christ uh, and they're asking, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And in those days, there were apparently two main schools of thought among the Jews. There was the school of Shammai, which took a stricter view that divorce was only permissible in the case of, of gross immorality, found in the wife, probably referring to serious sexual sin. Uh, then there was the school of Hillel, which taught that you know taught a, a much looser understanding that divorce was permissible for all sorts of reasons. So under H- Hillel's teaching, if a wife should spill her husband's food or, or, or burn the dinner, oversalt the food, pretty much do anything that displeased the husband, she could be divorced. Uh, under that view, divorce was pretty much at the whim of the husband. So I suppose they're coming to Christ and they're asking the question, which view is right? Well, it's worth noticing that before the Lord gives any sort of answer to that question, he brings the Pharisees back to basics. He takes them to Genesis and to the creation account, and he establishes the principle that marriage is meant to be permanent. Before even dealing with, is there, is there a place for divorce in any ground? He deals with this point. Marriage is meant to be permanent. He says in verse 4, Have you not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. That's the principle established at the beginning. A man leaves father and mother, he cleaves to his wife. They they hold fast together, they join together, they hold together 
and the two of them are now considered one. They're made one flesh. And the Lord describes these two as having been joined by God himself and says in verse 6, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So again, before even addressing the question of are there circumstances in which divorce can happen, the Lord is really emphasizing this central principle. Marriage is meant to be permanent. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Let not man separate. This is to be a permanent arrangement. You know, whenever we bring two people together in marriage, uh, we use vows that are at least similar to this. We, you know, I, I call upon these persons here present to witness that I, so-and-so, take you, so-and-so, to be my lawful wedded wife, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us do part. And that last little statement is not a sentimental extra. It's a solemn promise before God. Uh, I'm entering into this, and I'm entering into this with the determination I'm going to hold to this until death. The only thing that is meant to bring a marriage to an end is death. And that's it. So, so what a tragedy then when a marriage crumbles to nothing prematurely. And it's even more of a tragedy whenever you recognize, as we covered a couple of weeks ago, that marriage is meant to be a wonderful picture of the relationship between Christ and his church, between the Lord and his people. Uh, throughout scripture, the Lord often uses the, the marriage language to speak about his dealings with his people. For, for example, in Ezekiel 16, verse 8, um, that's what's happening when the Lord says, When I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God. Thou becamest mine. Now, the, the spreading of the skirt there might seem like strange language to us, but it's the language of marriage. That's what Ruth asked Boaz to do for her in Ruth 3, verse 9. I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread, therefore, thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. She, she's asking for marriage. And that's what the Lord says as he deals with his people. I, I spread my skirt over you. He's saying, I, I took you to myself. I, I married you. I entered covenant with you. You became mine. The Lord uses this marriage language with regard to his relationship with his people. And the marriage between a man and a woman upheld properly is meant to be a wonderful portrayal of the gospel love of God for his people. And of course, clearly, divorce breaks that picture altogether. You know, the Lord does not divorce his elect. Christ does not divorce those for whom he died. The Lord sets his love upon his people and we are loved and we will be loved right through onto eternity. Now, even just with that picture in mind, you know, let me just let me stress to you who are the Lord's, what a blessing is yours. That you are loved with an everlasting love. That the Lord has taken you to himself. That he will never cast you off. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never send you out or he will never abandon you. He will never divorce you. you. You who are saved are bought with a price. You are his and you will be his for all of eternity. What a, what, what a security that relationship gives us whenever it's with the Lord, the one who will not go back on his covenant, the one who will not break his word, the, the God who is faithful. What, what a, a security there is there. And of course, there ought to be something of that security in a, in a marriage between a man and a woman. That's one of the great blessings of marriage. It's meant to give a real security. You know, you, you've got, in every case, two sinners brought together, and, and they're going to wrong each other in certain ways uh, right the way through married life, but there, there's a security there because there's, there's a commitment, there's a bond. And what a tragedy when it fails miserably and when the whole thing breaks down in divorce. It... it breaks that security and it breaks the bigger picture of the Lord's wonderful dealings with his church, with his people. It's for that reason, among other things, that we're told in, in Malachi 2, uh, verses 15 and 16, 
take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. That is, he, he hateth divorce. And the verse goes on, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. The righteous God hates divorce. And therefore God's people are, are urged to take heed. Take heed to your very spirit. Take, take heed to your heart. Guard yourself against dealing treacherously against the, the wife of your youth. Or you could reverse it and say the husband of your youth. Especially for those who are the Lord's. How high a view we ought to have of our marriages. And, and in light of it, how how eagerly and earnestly are we to fight for our marriages, to, to strive to guard and to protect our marriage, to, to strive to love our spouse and to grow in love for our spouse, to, to guard our marriage and to honor God with our marriage. The Lord hates divorce. So there is a tragedy in the case of divorce. Uh, notice then, secondly, the guilt involved in divorce. Now, so far I've described divorce as a tragedy. And it is that. But we're going further than that now, and we're being clear that divorce always involves sin. And I stress that word, always. It always involves sin somewhere along the line. Now, apparently, my Australian history is not very good, but from what I read online, the, the Family Law Act of 1975 established the principle of no-fault divorce in Australian law. But be clear that according to scripture, there is no such thing as a no-fault divorce. Divorce is always the result of sin. It might be the result of sin in one person. Quite often, it's probably the result of sin in both people. But never is there a no-fault divorce. When, when a divorce comes about, there's either guilt for the one who pursues that divorce whenever they are doing so without proper grounds or without a legitimate reason, or, or else there's guilt attached to the one who has given those reasonable grounds. There is no such thing as a no-fault divorce. Divorce never happens without the presence of sin. If you look at verse 9 here in Matthew 19, we have very similar words to those we saw last week in Matthew 5. The Lord says, I, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. That is, he's, he's breaking the seventh commandment. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Uh, the, the Lord is speaking here in terms of the guilt of the man primarily. He's talking to Pharisees and probably to men, and he's, he's attaching the guilt here to the men uh, largely. Uh, as the same conversation is put in Mark 10, verse 11, uh, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And there the way Mark frames it, he, it's the same conversation really, but he makes clear there is this idea of wrongly divorcing. Whether you're the man, whether you're the woman, wrongly divorcing is to break the seventh commandment. It is to commit adultery. It's to break the commandment. Likewise, um, the one who, obviously the one who commits fornication, we'll, we'll come to think about that ground in a moment um, and the, the legitimacy of divorce in, in certain cases. But even there, clearly there has been sin that has occurred. No divorce is clean and, and tidy. You know, marriage is a, is a covenant relationship and there is a responsibility placed on both husband and wife to guard that relationship and to do all in your power to uphold it. You know, when two people have, think of the excuses that are sometimes used today for divorce, when two people have drifted apart and they don't love each other anymore, as it's put, be clear that they are not the victims of changing circumstances. They are not the victims of some strange thing that happened in the ether that caused their affections just randomly to change. It's not just that they've fallen out of love with each other and are not meant to be together anymore. The problem probably there is that they have not been committing to the relationship as, as they ought. You know, if you, if you don't love your wife anymore and you're saying, well, I, I think I need to pursue a divorce because I don't love my wife anymore. The problem is that you're 
failing to honor the Lord. Because whenever you're called to love your wife, we're not talking about some rosy feeling. Loving your wife is not a nice feeling. It's a, it's a purpose. It's something that you can purpose to do. It's something that the Bible calls us to do with our enemies. It's not, a, it's not that we have a nice rosy feeling toward our enemies, but we're to love our enemies. We're to purpose to set our love upon them. And all, all the more in a marriage, we, we are told to set our love upon one another. The husband is called to set his love upon his wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ's love for the church was not a romantic feeling. It was an active, sacrificial, costly love, a setting forth of his love for the good of his people, on his people. That's the duty of a husband to a wife. It's not so much I've fallen out of love with her. Well, if you've fallen out of love with her, set your love on her again. Just do it. That's essentially what we're talking about. Just do it. Just love her. Actively, purposely, love her. Of course, we could turn it around and apply it to the wife. You have a, a duty to commit yourself to your husband. Not because you feel like it, but because it's right. Because it's good. Because it's what you're, you're called to. When two people have drifted apart, it's because they, or at least one of them, have not been taking their duty seriously. They're, they're not committing themselves to the, the, the relationship and the duties of it with determination. And where that road ends, with either the husband or the wife, divorcing their spouse without legitimate grounds, that is the ultimate forsaking of your marriage duty. Of course, where there is literal adultery committed against the marriage, that itself is an act of tremendous treachery, a sin against God and a sin against your spouse. Divorce always involves great guilt somewhere in the picture, whether in one party or both. Now, let me stress, it's very difficult for outsiders to look on at a marriage that's failed. By outsiders, I mean those who are not part of that marriage. It's very difficult to look on and automatically to know and think you know all the details and how careful the church needs to be as we look at those perhaps who have had a failed marriage, how careful we need to be not to just jump to conclusions when we don't know all the details. I would say that as a guard. How careful we need to be not to be just quickly looking down our nose at someone who's had a failed marriage. But divorce always involves guilt somewhere in the picture. Now, Again, I would stress to you who are married, before it even gets to this place where you're asking yourself, should I get divorced? Purpose to commit yourself to your marriage. You you get to this place where you're even questioning like this. Quite often after a long long track of, of not committing yourself to the marriage in the way that you ought, not taking your marriage duty seriously. That's often how you end up at this place where uh, you're, you're not feeling like you want to keep going in the marriage. I would say to you, even if you're not there yet, praise God for that, but invest in your marriage and continue to invest in it and remember to do so with your eye upon the Lord, laboring for the marriage in the power of God and not in the flesh. Seek to honor Christ by how you seek to uphold your marriage. It's something to fight for. It's not something to tear apart flippantly or to destroy wickedly. Let's then move on to think about the grounds for divorce. Uh, Upon what basis is divorce ever warranted? You know, that's one of the key questions that's being asked by the Pharisees uh, of Christ. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Uh, After the Lord gave the basic principle that God has joined these two people together. They're they're meant to remain together. You'll see in verse 7 that the Lord is asked a follow-up question. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And they're quoting from Deuteronomy 24 and from verse 1. Um, It might actually help you to go to that passage, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1. I mentioned two schools of thought in Jewish society. There was the stricter school of Shammai. There was the more loose group, the school of Hillel. And while believing different things, both of them would have cited this passage. It says, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, 
she may go and be another man's wife. And it goes on. Now, uncleanness there, it says in verse 1, he finds some uncleanness in her. Um, refers to something shameful. It's used in the previous chapter to refer to something that should not be seen as the Lord walks through the camp of Israel. Um, it's, it's a general word that's used in the previous chapter that way. And, and here it's clearly speaking of something shameful. But it's not really clearly defined for us. Now going to this passage, that the stricter group, they would, they would really emphasize this part of it. Uh, the man finding some uncleanness in his wife and probably with reference to a serious sexual sin of some sort. Uh, similarly, the, the more liberal group, they would go to the very same passage, but they would emphasize that the part about the wife finding no more favor in her husband's eyes. And that's why they're saying, well, she doesn't find favor in his eyes so he can divorce her. But which of these groups is right or is either right? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize the purpose of Deuteronomy 24. Christ is quick to highlight the purpose of this passage. He says in verse 8, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, and this is back in Matthew 19, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He's saying the instruction of Deuteronomy 24, it was not given so as to open up the door of divorce, uh, the door for divorce on demand. It was simply giving... For a start, a process to regulate divorce, and it was giving restrictions on divorce. The, one of the key points here is that if a hard-hearted man is going to divorce his wife, whatever the reason might be, he needs to write her a bill of divorce. And at least to, to some extent, that is going to guard the woman. It's going to, I suppose in one part, it's going to prove that she is free to remarry. She's been legally, properly divorced. The, the essential formula in a Jewish bill of divorce, apparently was, you are free to marry any man. But on top of that, the actual point in that passage, when you go on, is more a technical point that if, if the husband divorces her, and then she remarries, and then the second husband either hates her or else he dies, and that marriage is now over, that she's not to go back to the first husband. That's the main point in that whole passage that she's not to go back to the first husband if she's been divorced and then remarried someone else in the middle. And I suppose the passage then is really emphasizing that people ought to stop and to think before they flippantly get rid of their wife because they may well regret it down the line. They're closing the door that they can't remarry her if she's been divorced from them and remarried someone else in the middle. It's warning about that. It's regulating, it's restricting divorce. You could say that the Pharisees, while they're using this passage to teach on marriage and to try and argue for lots of reasons for divorce, really the, the passage is merely presupposing that divorce is going to happen due to men's hardness of heart. And, and here's what has to happen in that case. And here's certain things that are restricted in that case. These are the instructions for a, a crash landing. And the Pharisees are using them for how to fly the plane. That's basically what's, what's happening. You wouldn't get on a plane if the pilot is only using the instructions that are there for the case of a crash landing as his manual for how to fly the plane. But that's what this passage is. Whenever, whenever divorce is going to happen, here are certain things that must be in place. Here are certain things to keep in mind. It's, it's not, it's not the, the instruction from which to regulate all sorts of things. But that's what the Pharisees are doing. And yet, while we have to be careful not to think of this passage as if it's just opening the door widely for divorce, I want you to notice that in the Lord's answer, he does give an exception. He says in verse 9 of Matthew 19, except it be for fornication. You know, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Now, I'll say that there are a number of arguments against adultery as a grounds for divorce, and you'll, you'll hear them put forward. Um, I can't get into all of it today, otherwise we'll be forever going through lots of little details. But you can feel free to talk to me at some point if, you would, if you'd like. But uh, what I would say is I can't accept the different arguments that are made along those lines. It seems to me pretty straightforward that in a day when 
Whatever school of thought you took, everyone believed that there were at least some sort of grounds when divorce could be legitimate, whether you took it very strictly or not. In Christ's answer, he, he gives some sort of ground for divorce. He seems to anyway, except it be for fornication. If the Lord was trying to say that there's never a time when you can divorce, it would certainly seem a strange phrase to include in the sentence. You know, what we believe, certainly in our own denomination, is summed up in our Confession of Faith, chapter 24, which does allow for divorce in very specific circumstances. Now, it's not opening the door for wide for divorce on demand. It still recognizes divorce as a tragic thing and a, a sinful thing in terms of sin has to be involved somewhere. But it states that in the case of adultery after marriage, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue out a divorce and after the divorce to remarry another as if the offending party were dead. In such a case, the innocent party is at liberty to divorce his or her spouse. Then our confession recognizes one other grounds for divorce. That's drawing from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In that chapter, the Apostle Paul is addressing this same issue of marriage, but he's dealing with a difficult context, a different one from that of Israel. Because he's dealing with believers living in a Gentile world where the gospel has gone out into the world. And you have many cases where one of a married couple has come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other hasn't. And they find themselves now in a position where in this marriage one is a believer and the other is not. Now in verses 12 through 14 of that chapter, Paul urges the new convert to, where possible, remain with the unbeliever. In fact, he encourages them that the Lord can use them to, to bring their spouse to the Lord. But sadly, there would be cases where upon a husband or a wife coming to Christ, and of course, remember that coming to Christ is not just signing your name on the dotted line. Coming to Christ is going to involve a whole transformation of life. It's going to involve forsaking some of the previous sins that you used to love. It's going to naturally cause a huge disruption in what perhaps was a harmonious pagan family life. It's, it's going to cause issues, naturally. So there would, be, there would be times when the unsaved husband or wife would rebel against it, and they would abandon their newly converted spouse. And Paul writes, dealing with that setting in verse 15, and says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage. In such cases, but God hath called us on to peace. Now again, the language that Paul uses there, saying the believer is not under bondage, it, as I read it anyway, it certainly implies not only divorce, but also the possibility of remarriage, because to say that she's not under bondage is essentially to say the same thing as that Jewish bill of divorce, which states you're free to marry any man, you're free, you're not under bondage, you're free. But admittedly here, it's not so much a believer ending their marriage. It's more the marriage being ended on them. It's more that they've been abandoned. And it's done because they've been sinned against. The, the, the marriage bond has been forsaken by the other person. And they're given liberty here to consider the marriage as finished due to that sinful abandonment they've experienced. So those things really form the two grounds of divorce that we have in the Bible. Our confession puts it this way, nothing but adultery or such willful desertion as can, by, as can no way be remedied by the church or civil magistrate is cause sufficient of dissolving the bond of marriage. You know, we're to uphold a view of marriage, a high view, so that it's not to be ended for flippant reasons. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, in verses 10 and 11, Paul says that he has a command from the Lord. And by that he means that he's directly applying the teaching of Christ from those gospel accounts. And he, he charges the married woman there that she is not to separate from her husband. And likewise, he charges the husband not to send away the wife. And he states in verse 11, with regard to the wife, you could apply it to the husband too, but he speaks regarding the wife that if she ignores the instruction, if she does depart and forsake her husband, she's to remain unmarried or else to be reconciled to her husband. In other words, the church is not to condone a wife, or we could say a husband too, just putting away their spouse for foolish reasons, for reasons outside of what Scripture gives us. There is no grounds to just walk away 
because you feel like it. Remember, there are some particular grounds, but the general point is that marriage is not something that you can lift up and then put down at your convenience. On that day when two, two individuals stand before the Lord and they vow together to love one another and to hold to one another and to labor together till death they do part, uh, until death them do part, that's a, a solemn thing. It's not to be taken lightly. It's not to be walked away from casually. Now, having tried to cover all that, can I give the warning that very often life is not going to be immediately clear-cut? Life does not always look quite as black and white as the clear principles established by God's Word. You know, even take a clear-cut case. Generally speaking, there will be a need to work through these things on a case-by-case basis, often seeking help to do so. Our confession is wise when it talks about that issue of willful desertion that cannot be remedied by the church or civil magistrate. Of course, civil magistrate does nothing today to try and remedy these things, but certainly for the church, there is the assumption that every effort will be taken to preserve the marriage. Even in that case where the unbeliever would abandon a believer, there is the idea that we should even there still be striving to Uphold the marriage where possible, striving to remedy it before just quickly uh, casting it off. You know, generally speaking, this question of whether to divorce or whether to remain together and to work at your marriage, if you're sadly placed in a position where you have to make that decision, it's something to be very careful over, something you need support with, something you'll probably need advice with, something you'll need to spend time in prayer over. And again, even where there are grounds for divorce, I would urge you to remember that the starting place that Christ brought us to is that marriage should be permanent. And that's the ideal for a marriage to endure till death us do part. You know, even if you take one of those clear-cut cases where obvious, clear, dreadful adultery has been committed, you have been wronged in your marriage, Your, your spouse has done wickedly against you, Even then, I would suggest the starting place, at least the starting consideration for the Christian ought to be, is it possible to somehow deal with this and get beyond this and to preserve the marriage? Now, obviously that would be hard. Obviously that would take time and effort and involve plenty of pain. But we ought to be at least asking the question, is it possible for me to deal with this dreadful wrong that's been done to me In the context of the gospel, is it possible to work through these things where there's real repentance and real forgiveness? Even in those dreadful times where it's clear cut, it's obvious you have been wronged. For a believer, I would urge you, divorce should not be your your first port of call. It should not be looked upon as, hooray, there's my excuse, I better get away. That's the wrong attitude altogether. Rather, the first and the main objective should be, is it possible to work through this? Is it possible to save this marriage and to strengthen this marriage? Now, maybe you'll find that you can't, and certainly divorce is permitted in some of these cases. An innocent party is not to be looked down upon when it comes to that. But I'm stressing that, especially for the Christian, should the starting place not be, at least, is it possible to not only forgive, but then to work through this and to preserve the marriage? You know, that ought to be our starting place because that's how the Lord deals with us. You know, how many times have we been unfaithful to the Lord? How many times have we sinned against the Lord and yet we have a Savior who loved us unto death and he died to forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all our sins that we might be reconciled unto him and having brought us to himself, he is faithful and he, he keeps his people. Now, it's not going to be possible to save every marriage, sadly where great sin has occurred. And there is legitimate, there is real provision for that with such thing as a legitimate divorce in those particular cases. But as we think about the Lord's relationship with us, we have a saviour who's promised in John six thirty seven, all that the Father giveth, giveth to me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I'll not cast them away. 
What a blessing it is to be a child of God by faith, to be bound to Christ, where he says, I will not cast you away. I mean, we come to Christ recognizing our sin. We come to Christ recognizing that we don't deserve his favor. We come at his invitation and he receives us willingly and he gives us this reassurance. No matter what you think of yourself, no matter how many failures you see in yourself, no matter how deserving you are of being cast away, he says, I will in no wise cast you out. I'm willing to save you. I'm willing to keep you. What a blessing it is to be a child of God by faith, to be bound to Christ in a covenant that he will never break. How good to be a recipient of the love of Christ and to know as as Romans 8 verse 39 tells us that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a blessing is yours if you've been brought into union with Christ by faith. And what a blessing can be yours today if you'll heed his promise and if you'll come at the gospel invitation and receive of the Savior. And he promises he'll not cast you out. He'll not leave you. He'll not forsake you. He'll keep you right through to glory. Now, in light of what we've been dealing with, let me close similarly to how I did last week. Well, first of all, maybe I should just say I'm conscious there are lots of other connected issues we could cover here. If we had the time, we don't. But let me close to how I, similar to how I did last week. We live in a world where, sadly, Many lives are filled with the scars of past sin, either sins we've committed or the sins that have been committed against us. And certainly this is one of those areas that has left its mark in a very severe way. But for those who have had failed marriages or even those who've had to go through the the connected difficulties involved in these things, uh, even if it doesn't end up with marriage being utterly broken, I would point you to that woman that Christ met with at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. You know, there's a woman whose life was a mess with the scars of divorce. Christ looked at her in verse 18 and recognized that she had previously had five different husbands. Five different husbands. And here she is living with someone who was not her husband. Her life was badly scarred through all sorts of failed marriages. We're not, of course, told uh, what ended those marriages, but five different marriages, and she's currently living with someone who's not her husband. And yet the marvelous thing is that Christ had an interest in a woman like her, despite all the scars of sin. In fact, you could perhaps say Christ had an interest in her even due to the scars of sin. He came for sinners. He came to rescue the guilty. He came to lift up and heal the broken. Now, there are many today who stand totally exposed before the seventh commandment, whether it's due to failed marriage, whether it's due to uh, different sexual sins, whether it's due to lust of the heart. And yet, praise God, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Praise God, he came not for the righteous, but for the guilty. Praise God that while Christ had little time for the Pharisees who thought themselves all very decent and very righteous and in no need of salvation, he did have time for people like that woman whose life was a mess. He had time for her. He was willing to save someone like her. Praise God he came to give everlasting life to people like her and therefore to people like you and me. You might be very aware of the scars of sin in your life, whether it's on this issue of adultery, whether it's on the issue of broken marriage, whether it's on something else altogether, you might be very aware of the scars that sin has left in your life. And yet, Christ came to give life to someone like you. If you bring your sin to him and let him deal with it and let him forgive you. As we deal with this whole theme of divorce and remarriage, It's not so much about some of us saying, you know, hooray, I have a wonderful life of success. My marriage has succeeded. I I stand before God well. And then others despairing and saying, oh, my my life has been a mess. And what a failure. You know, like the rest of the commandments, the, the whole purpose is to point us to the Savior of sinners. It's not designed to make us feel good about ourselves. 
It's not designed to leave us in utter despair. It's designed to point us to the Savior of sinners and to cause every one of us to, yes, recognize our guilt in different ways, but to cause us to cast ourselves upon Christ and to recognize no matter what baggage we carry from the past or the present or what things there will be in the future, here is a Savior who redeems us from all sin, who cleanses us from all sin, and through the work of the cross, he will bring us to stand in his presence without spot or blemish. What a blessing it is to take refuge in Christ. Amen. Amen.